Hi, folks. I'm Katie Human. I'm the Communications Director for Ceres, which is the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. Welcome to Taking Landsat 8 to the Extreme, or the coldest place on Earth. I'd like to introduce Ted Scambos, who's the lead scientist for the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado, and Jim Irons, the Landsat 8 Project Manager at NASA Goddard. <laughs> project scientist for uh, Landsat Aid at NASA Goddard. Thanks so much for coming. Well, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today a bit about uh, how we've been able to use uh, some existing satellites uh, in orbit that have been in orbit for many years, and also a brand new satellite, a satellite that was launched in February with some tremendous capability. What we were able to do relatively easily was take the uh, data and sift through it and find uh, indications of the coldest surface temperature yet measured on Earth. Um, it's in Antarctica, of course. And uh, we've also been able to use Landsat 8, a remarkable new satellite, uh, to uh, confirm some of the measurements that we made and start down the path of really refining uh, exactly uh, how these cold occurrences happen and um, what their distribution is and a little bit more about the physics behind them. I owe a lot to the co-authors here, the, the people that are next on the list after my name. I'm more of a spokesperson, really. Uh, the rest of the team did a lot of the work, and uh, I appreciate that. And in fact, I'll be directing some questions to them if you ask the right ones. <clears throat> so I want to make a few clear statements here about what we've done and, and what we've learned from all of this, because there could be some misunderstanding about exactly what we're talking about with coldest place on Earth. We took a series of satellite data sets and we measured the thermal emission temperature. That's the same as the temperature that you would feel if you were to take your hand and place it on the surface of the snow, which I don't recommend because in this case it would be a bit colder than dry ice, actually. Uh, we took the coldest data out of a 32-year period between 1982 and 2013 from a number of satellites. Uh, one of the first things that we discovered was that over a central region in the plateau, the very coldest days, the very coldest occurrences always occur under clear sky conditions. So we did not have to worry about cloud masking the data in order to see the record low temperatures, at least for the aqua modus um, and for the AVHRR time series that we had. The map of the coldest temperatures is a kind of map of the surface. And so what this uh, map has shown is that there are ultra-low temperatures below minus 90 degrees centigrade. That's about minus 130 um, degrees Fahrenheit. They occur in local topographic lows just to the south side of a ridge across the crest of the East Antarctic Plateau. The East Antarctic Plateau stretches to about 4,000 meters, 4,100 meters, right around 13,000, 14,000 feet in elevation. Um, the location of these things are not completely but fairly consistently to the south side of this ridge, and we think we know why. Uh, these areas routinely surpass the record low air temperature that was measured at Vostok. Now, in Vostok, uh, one early interview suggested that maybe we had a place in the Guinness Book of World Records here. No, that, that won't happen because the uh, World Meteorological Organization recognizes air temperatures measured a couple of meters, two meters, about six feet, above the surface as being the, the, the uh, uh, measurement of record for cold or warm air temperatures. So there's a record yet to be measured here uh, to go out to some of these sites and measure the air temperature at the same time. However, uh, we're confident that we found the coldest surface temperature and that hand in hand with that will be record low air temperatures a short distance above the surface. Um, so here's the uh, lowest air temperature that we have uh, on record, about 136 degrees Fahrenheit below zero, measured on the 10th of August in 2010. This is a bit different from the uh, abstract, and I'm sorry about that, but we sifted through more data and found some new uh, record setting uh, temperatures in there. The record low Vostok air temperature for reference uh, was measured in 1983 on the 21st of July at just warmer than 130 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. And we use Landsat 8, which I'll show in detail, uh, to investigate these. Uh, one of the, the two science directions we're hoping to go in is what sort of climate and weather conditions lead to these ultra-cold occurrences, and we have some early thoughts on that. 
And is there a physical limit to how cold the surface of the Earth can get? Is there something in the atmosphere or the atmosphere and surface system that sets a, a physical limit? And the reason I say that is because a number of places widely scattered reached more or less the same low temperature uh, repeatedly. This is uh, sort of the, uh, the take-home graphic of, in a single graphic for the record low uh, skin temperature measurement or surface temperature measurement. It summarizes a lot of the data. There's an outline of Antarctica there. The uh, lowest temperatures on record for each pixel um, in the MODIS record is shown there south of 70 degrees. The coastline is black because we masked out that data knowing it wouldn't contain record low temperatures and to save on data volume. Um, you see Vostok's location there. Vostok's located over a large lake. You see the two lowest temperatures, one for 2013, some distance away, almost the same temperature as the lowest on our record in 2010. Uh, the purple boxes there are the Landsat 8 images that we uh, have used for a part of this analysis. Um, they're cloud-free images across the crest of Antarctica. I'd like to show you a couple of videos that were made by NASA. They've done a really good job of summarizing um, what's to be said and, uh, uh, and also took some earlier interview work and, and uh, there's a voiceover on it from me that kind of describes what we're talking about nicely. It's an incredible place to be. It's desolate and yet it's um, compelling in a lot of ways. There's a sense that uh, humans have never been in these areas much before. Uh, there's a strong sense that you really humans don't have any place there. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a comfortable continent, but at the same time it's stark and beautiful and, and, and amazing way up at the top of the ice sheet. It's about 13,000 to 14,000 feet. It's actually a very flat plain, but it's slightly higher than all the area around it. That's the area we started looking at. There's a, uh, a lot of atmospheric science and climate science that's behind what produces the coldest temperatures in Antarctica. The home of all of that is this area along the ridge, the highest part of the ridge in East Antarctica. Um, where if conditions are right, the temperatures plummet to extremely low levels, past the previous record low temperature recorded at, uh, by the Russians at a base called Vostok. What we found was that the coldest temperatures are actually just off of the crest. The crest is an area where the air, as soon as it gets to a low temperature, starts to drain away. What you need is a place where that air is actually caught and held for a while so that it can cool down still more by radiating away into um, space. And those are the places that we're finding these very, very low temperatures. You might say, let's go there. Um, and maybe in summer, that's a reasonable thing to try and do. It's, it's really cold. And so things like your ordinary thermometers, certainly <laughs> mercury thermometer won't work. An alcohol thermometer will have a lot of trouble. We're talking about temperatures that are 50 degrees colder than anything that has ever been seen in Alaska or in Siberia or certainly in North Dakota or Montana. And this one it helps describe the process a bit. I'll play through it. What we're seeing are temperatures that start off um, quite cold, and then when the sky clears, they drop fairly rapidly. If that condition can persist for a few days, um, the ground chills, gets quite cold. The ground itself is radiating away the heat into space, into clear space. And by getting very cold on the surface, you chill the atmosphere that's next to this very cold snow. This lower layer that's getting very cold under the clear sky conditions is denser and it starts to slide down this huge dome of Antarctica. What you need is a place where that air is actually caught and held for a while. So by causing the airflow to be stationary for an extended period, you get the absolute lowest temperatures that we're able to find. So <clears throat> here's a quick summary of the data again. Uh, on the uh, left there you see older data from a satellite run by NOAA called, uh, well the sensor is called AVHRR, the satellites are the POES, Polar 
uh, orbiting environmental satellite series, and then NASA Aquamodus data. It's the same representation, the coldest pixels that we could find. Um, it also shows quite clearly that both satellites showed that this upper area about 300, excuse me, 3,500 meters and upward is cloud free for the coldest temperatures on record. Um, this graphic here is probably better explained at the poster tomorrow that Garrett will have. Uh, but what we're showing here is that um, on the left especially, there's a broad area that reaches temperatures near the record that was measured at Vostok. You can see that near that Vostok at the bottom of the left-hand slide, there are some indications that within the MODIS record, it got close to its own past record from the 80s a few times, but that the area uphill surpasses this, reaches it and surpasses it a large number of times. Red areas near Dome Argus uh, represent 50 and more times that the temperature got below um, uh, 88 degrees centigrade. Um, there's a close association between both uh, topography, uh, the frequency of ultra cold events, and the record low temperature from the data set. And that's what those blue bars represent, flat areas just off of the dome. The dome does not have the record low temperature, but areas just off of it where air can collect uh, have the record. This graphic here shows some blue specks. They might be a little hard to see. Yeah, they're pretty pale. Uh, just down and to the left from Dome A, those are the uh, record low, excuse me, temperatures within a degree or so of the record low temperature that we found in the data. Um, now I want to talk a bit about Landsat 8 and what it did for us. And this is sort of the starting slide of that. This is what we got out of the box for Landsat 8. We collected, asked uh, NASA and USGS to acquire a whole series of wintertime images in the area that we already knew was likely to produce extremely cold temperatures. Um, we got several scenes that were almost completely cloud free. The left side of that colored rectangular patch is an almost cloud free scene from Landsat 8 from July 31st. Uh, that is the day that we had the coldest temperature on record for 2013, coldest surface temperature. Um, however, uh, it's not in the area that the lowest temperature occurred, and you can, I don't think you can make it out, but near Dome A, uh, the temperature reached 180.2, as I said before. You can see that we're able to see a lot of detail in the surface temperature, the skin temperature, so to speak, of the snow uh, in the Landsat data. Whoops. Four days in 2013 reached temperatures that were quite cold. We had images from all four. We're going to focus on some data from the 28th of July. That did the best job. As you can see immediately, Landsat gives us a lot more detail uh, spatially. Uh, the Landsat has 100 meter resolution. The MODIS has one kilometer resolution. We've calibrated the Landsat right now to the MODIS data pending a better calibration based on the sensor. As I said, it was launched in February. Uh, we collected this data that's uh, really outside the normal range of a calibration routine, and we're going to uh, work on calibrating the Landsat data in more detail. But what you can see in a side-by-side -side comparison is that um, there's going to be a lot more information about these very low temperature pockets that occur uh, high up in East Antarctica. And the Landsat also confirms uh, we got uh, better elevation data. This is very much vertically exaggerated, that lower curve. Uh, but even in uh, spots that are um, only a few meters deep, we see a big difference in terms of the minimum temperature that's recorded by uh, Landsat. In terms of uh, weather patterns that lead to uh, this sort of um, record low temperatures, Basically, as the video showed, when the air gets cold, it starts to slide downhill because it's denser. The air is chilled and it's trying to slide off of this very shallow dome and out to the coast. Um, what seems to trigger the uh, lowest temperatures is when the synoptic pattern, the pressure pattern from storms and high pressure cells in the area, oppose this downhill drainage, try to push the air back uphill. And that sort of uh, probably suspends the air in this lower layer that's trying to drain downhill in these coal pockets, allows them to chill still further through that surface radiation process and reach the record low temperatures. 
can humans survive in these temperatures? Well, yes, yes, we can for about three minutes or so. Um, at uh, the South Pole, there's a tradition when the temperature gets below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, they'll put the sauna up to about 200 inside, run outside, and for about three minutes, you can stand out there, get a selfie taken, and run the heck back inside. Uh, and uh, this is much better uh, visual content, I think, for me. I mean, look at the sensors and panels on that guy, but uh, basically this is Landsat 8, and it really is a remarkable satellite. There are going to be a lot of discoveries uh, that come out from Landsat 8, and a lot of operational data, a lot of uh, mapping and measurement of things like agriculture uh, to come from it. Uh, Jim. Thank you, Ted. I hope uh, nobody on the 300 Club uh, suffered any frostbite. No, there were actually some horrific injuries. <laughs> yes, <laughs> have occurred. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm ex very excited to be at the American uh, Geophysical Union Fall Meeting because I'm here in part to learn about uh, initial and early results achieved with Landsat data. Uh, such as those presented by Dr. Scambos, and across uh, many of the earth science disciplines uh, that are represented here uh, at the fall meeting. Uh, as you, uh, as Ted mentioned, hopefully this will go. Yeah. Whoops. Sir. No, we went back. We'll try that again. As Ted 10, mentioned, uh, nine, the eight, the eight seven, Landsat six, satellite five, was launched. Four, three, two. The 8th Landsat satellite was launched on February 11th of this year from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The mission was developed through an interagency partnership between NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey uh, within the Department of the Interior. And since the launch, the performance of the satellite, uh, its instrument payload, and the ground system has been spectacular. The system has been returning over 500 scenes, or Landsat images, uh, per day to the 41-year free and open Landsat data archive that's maintained by the U.S. Geological Survey at their facility in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, known as Eros. I wanted to mention that a, a survey released just this month by the USGS indicated that the Landsat program uh, benefited the U.S. economy by $1.79 billion in 2011. Uh, I'm confident that Landsat 8, uh, with its excellent performance, will increase that annual return on investment, both in terms of the economy and in terms of the scientific return from uh, analyses of the outstanding data that we're getting. So thank you. I just want to underscore what Jim said. Really, Landsat 8, uh, I've, I've never been so impressed by a launch. I, I guess it's happened before, but uh, from, from the, it, it launched within milliseconds of when it had been planned to launch for months in advance. I have yet to hear of a serious problem that the uh, mission has had in any of the sensors or telemetry. But maybe that's because Jim's not telling me about them, but I certainly, <laughs> it hasn't interrupted the science at all, and it's been available very rapidly and for free from USGS. They've, they've done a great job. Um, now, the in-orbit uh, commissioning of the satellite went very smoothly. Uh, First light data was collected on March 18th of 2013. The system became operational on May 30th when uh, the lead for operations were turned over to the U.S. Geological Survey and data uh, collected even before it became officially uh, operational are, are now in the archives since about, uh, well, since March 18th really and now available uh, for free uh, for anybody who uh, would like to come to the archive and download the data. So, any questions? Yeah, I, uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC. I mean, I guess, I guess the question is, how low can you go? I mean, um, that's our I think question that's quite, too. Yeah, I mean, that's quite an interesting question. And just sort of allied to that as well, the, the temperatures, the low temperatures, are all on the south side of the ridge. Is is that simply a function of being nearer to the bottom of the planet, or or is there a, a another reason for that? I, I, I'm. I think my my guess is that um, 
In general, low pressure cells are to the perimeter of the continent, a high pressure sometimes in the center. I, I, I think it has to do with the setting up a pressure gradient, that that's more typically opposing the downhill flow on the south side of the ridge than on the north side of the ridge. There are a few areas on the north side of the ridge that nearly equal the record temperature, so it's not impossible. It just happens more frequently on the south side. The other thing uh, I noticed is that the south side, um, yeah, because of the rate of snow accumulation, is uh, flatter than the north side, and so uh, probably has more of these shallow pockets to capture the cold air temperatures. How low can you go? That really astonished us that uh, across, I don't know if you could see the blue specks, but across a broad swath of that ridge, uh, temperatures got below, I, I talked in, I may have said Kelvin or had Kelvin on that screen, but got below about 92 degrees uh, Celsius, below zero, and that uh, is within a degree of the lowest temperature that we saw. Um, it's surprising that all of those places would have so similar a record, and we convinced ourselves by looking at Landsat and other satellites that that wasn't a function of some floor in the sensor's ability to measure temperature. Um, the direction we're going in is the possibility that there are very thin stratospheric clouds. They form frequently uh, over winter. They may be um, limiting how cold the surface can get. Uh, it may simply be that um, uh, weather systems um, don't last long enough for it to get much colder and there's some sort of asymptotic uh, trail off as to how cold it gets after your fifth or sixth day of clear skies. Um, there's a complex thermal uh, environment really to explain this skin temperature. There's still warmth, if you could call it that, from the past summer in the snow a meter or so below the surface that's trying to warm this surface snow. And then there's a, a sky temperature. The air itself radiates at a certain temperature. Plus, if there are any very thin clouds, uh, they may also be contributing to the radiation environment. And then you've got the air flowing around, which is uh, chilled near the surface, but then flowing into these pools and, and forming presumably a deeper pocket of cold air um, and one that chills still further because it doesn't move off of that surface. So, um, as you can see, those are the directions that, that we're moving in right now is to unwrap all of that complexity. We have a question from the web. Yeah, this question is from Seth Borenstein from the AP um, for TED. Wave a hand. Oh, there we are. Hi. Yeah, it's from the, from, from the chat. Um, he said, I know this isn't comparable to the Guinness air temperature record, but is this comparable to other satellite temperatures, or are we talking apples to oranges? And can you reconcile with climate change? Also, how would this feel? And um, if you could repeat the elevation again for the lowest temperature that you mentioned. Oh, the elevation. I don't think we noted the elevation. We have the latitude and longitude for the coldest temperatures. The elevation is uh, around 3850 meters above sea level, um, uh, above 3800 for both the 2013 and the 2010 record. There's a lot of questions in there. Let's see, apples to oranges. No um, thermal sensors are all more or less in the same part of the spectrum. And the algorithms that we've sifted through are attempting to report the, an accurate surface skin temperature. I, I guess something I forgot to say, this is a lot more about where low temperatures occur and how low temperatures occur, and not so much about the absolute lowest temperature, because that number, as we reprocess the satellite data, is, is bound to change. I'm confident that these pockets are the coldest places on Earth. The ones that we found are the coldest on record right now. Uh, whether or not they're 136 or 138 or 135 degrees below zero, it, We'll be determining that for a while. However, uh, uh, that they're the coldest places and where they are and how they form, we're on the trail of, of knowing that and pretty confident that we've got it down to these smaller areas. Apples to apples through the sensor series, uh, the elevations, and there was another question in there. Oh, how, how would does you reconcile feel? with climate change? Feel? Thank God, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly cold. I understand that it hurts to breathe, and it's certainly dangerous to breathe heavy. Um, one of the pieces of equipment that's sometimes used when people work on the plateau are sort of snorkels that go down into your jacket so that your body warms the air before you breathe it. 
um, in other words, out your sleeve, so that uh, you don't inhale by accident this very cold air. Uh, the snow makes a tremendous amount of noise when you walk on it. It, it sounds like you're walking on crushed glass because it's, it's very firm compared to what we're used to. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thank God I don't know exactly how, how it feels. And there's, I think there was one more part. It was, and can you reconcile with climate change? And I, I knew that question would come up. Um, generally speaking, you would expect that the record low temperature uh, on the surface of the Earth would slowly climb due to an increase in greenhouse gases, reducing the ability for heat to be radiated to space. However, the effect in Antarctica for in a dry atmosphere of CO2, methane, and the other gases by themselves without the augmentation from water vapor is probably very small. Whether or not it would be sufficient to be even detectable from satellite over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, I think is uh, debatable. It's more likely that natural variability, just meteorological freak occurrences, would have a bigger impact on whether or not you got a new record low temperature or never saw that temperature again for many years. Thank you. Ned Rosell. Alaska Science Forum. Does this Landsat 8 orbit so we could see Alaska? Yes, indeed. Because and every image, every time it flies over Alaska, it has to acquire images cloudy or not. Uh -huh. so, so this could do the same thing? Oh, certainly. And uh, if you're interested in the coldest place in, in Alaska, is that the idea? Or? Yeah, because Alaska's coldest all-time temp is minus 80 Fahrenheit. But North America's all-time low is minus 81 Fahrenheit, just over the border in uh, Canada, Beaver Creek. I, I, I can detect the competitiveness right yeah. here. Could you do that, do you think, with Landsat 8? Look for a Actually, cold spot uh, where you could uh, put out instruments? In a, in a, in a, in a simple sense, yes. Um, in terms of making, uh, in terms of where the publication that'll come out of this is going, it's much easier when you're looking at a snow surface, one kind of surface material, and more or less one density of that material in the surface of the snow, um, to, to, to try and really map it out in a complex environment like, like Alaska with trees and shrubs and lakes and varying water content and all that sort of stuff. I think it would be a lot tougher to do it uh, with precision, but chances are we could identify um, cold spots in Alaska, Siberia, Canada. Any plans to do that? No, Greenland and Antarctica, I'm gonna to stick to those two for now. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? Uh, I guess there's a question for, for Jim, really. I mean, the, the Landsat series is, a, as you say, a 40-year series, and, and the instruments, um, by definition, uh, through that four decades have to be complementary. Um, but I guess I guess what we're seeing here is is the the next generation or the new generation still being able to push new science frontiers. Yeah. Uh, I guess the answer to that is yes. <laughs> we uh, incorporated uh, technical advancements into the uh, uh, instruments aboard Landsat 8, the operational land imager and the thermal infrared sensor. Um, the radiometric performance of those sensors relative to the earlier sensors, the Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus uh, on Landsat 7 and the Thematic Mappers on Landsat 4 and 5. Uh, are, the instruments on Landsat 8 are, are uh, much more sensitive. Um, we, we quantify that in terms of a, a value called signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, they have signal-to-noise ratios um, six to eight times higher uh, than were achieved with the ETM plus. And as a consequence, the data are, are quantized or digitized to 12 bits rather than eight bits. And uh, with that increased sensitivity, I think that helps out studies uh, such, uh, such as those performed by, uh, by Dr. Scambos. Harvey Leifert, Freelance. Uh, just for the record, are any of the previous Landsat still operating? Yes, Landsat 7 is still in operation. Uh, it suffered a failure of one of the components of its optical system called the scanline corrector. 
Uh, the result of that has been uh, since 2003, since May of 2003, uh, there are uh, gaps, uh, intermittent gaps in Landsat 7 ETM plus images. Uh, about 20% of each image is, is, is in a gap, and uh, uh, but it's uh, otherwise the uh, satellite and the instrument uh, continue to perform very well, and there's enough fuel on board to maintain its orbit uh, uh, up until 2017 and perhaps through 2017. And Landsat 5 was recently deorbited? Well, it wasn't deorbited, but well, it was it was lowered a little bit, yeah. But it's uh, end of uh, life. End of life was officially in uh, February of this year, and actually the thematic mapper sensor stopped collecting data in uh, 2011, I think, or, or 2012. We have a, another question from the web streaming chat over here. Um, yeah, this is uh, from Seth Borenstein again from the AP. He said, since 2010 is old data, that's not Landstat 8, right? So is it fair to say this is a better look at satellite data? And also the other question is, um, people in much of the U.S. are feeling really cold with a bitter cold snap right now. Um, can you compare that to what you measured in Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> so the 2010 temperature is a MODIS uh, temperature. Only in 2013 were we able to compare the Landsat 8 uh, temperature data, thermal data, uh, to MODIS. Uh, 2013 hit nearly the same temperature and showed the same kind of uh, conditions on, on, on four days uh, this past winter. It, it tells us that in this area at least, these sorts of very low temperatures happen fairly frequently. Uh, I will say there are years when the temperature doesn't get all that close to these record temperatures. There are years where it doesn't go to these lower than Vostok type temperatures in this ridge area that I'm talking about, but it did in 2013 and it did in 2010 and in several of the years that we have data for from MODIS. Yeah, there's a cold snap going on, but um, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, this temperature is almost as cold below the freezing point of water as boiling water is above the freezing point of water. So it's really not something that people, I guess in Alaska they've got an idea. Uh, you know, minus 80 is respectable. That is, that, is, that is serious business. But this is minus 135. It really is something, once again, it, it, Antarctica has so many connections to planetary science. It's more like what you would see on Mars on a nice summer day in the, in the poles. Sorry, just to clarify this um, skin temperature versus air temperature, if you were to stick a, a physical sensor in one of those, in the record pocket, call it the record pocket, sure, sure. and it was two meters off the ground when it was 93.2, what would the air temperature be? Probably one or two degrees warmer than the surface temperature that we measured. Right, centigrade. okay, but still, uh, still warmer than Vostok. Then, yes, okay. and, and that's why I wouldn't be here if I didn't, wasn't pretty confident that we were colder than Vostok. If you walk through the data from Vostok, if you're looking at a map with Vostok in this area in it, it's quite clear that there's several degrees difference uh, between the Vostok area and, and this ridge area. Now, as I said, absolute temperatures are probably somewhat soft numbers. They're going to be revised. And Landsat 8 is going to do some poking around in these cold pockets and probably reveal that we can find a, a, a cold pixel and a measurement that we trust in an absolute sense that may well break the record. But right now, well, we've sifted through the MODIS data, we've compared it with Landsat, early Landsat data, we're still working on precise thermal algorithms, and we can see that there's record low areas far in excess of Vostok, and that well, we can also see that Landsat 8 is a great sensor for this job. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming. Our next press conference will begin at 3.30. It's on Green Lightning. We'll see you then.